Hello everybody and welcome to a player card roundup with Eric, who I can still call a new player until you've played every campaign. Those are, those, those are the rules. So this is still a new player talks about Feast of Hemlock Vale cards. Uh, Eric requested this actually, just so all of you know. Uh, Eric wanted to talk about the cards uh, for the new expansion uh, with your new player perspective and also just like... I get it. You're, it's like the most exciting part of Arkham. It's your first like new cards coming out. I remember when I first started playing Magic and uh, Fate Reforged started to get spoiled and I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever experienced in my life. Um, so I have, uh, we're not going to call this a spoiler roundup because uh, while all these cards, yes, have been spoiled, this is probably going to go on for a while. Eric and I are going to do these in chunks for it um, because realistically we don't have the time to record an entire card thing in one day. We only meet every two weeks to play Arkham and we're playing um, City of Archives today. So everyone who knows what that means is going to be, it's going to be pretty exciting and I can't wait to play. But uh, we're going to be doing this for all the player cards. I'm going to talk about them. Eric's going to talk about them. I'm going to get Eric's perspective, and I'm just going to join in on the fun. I did realize one thing that's interesting, too, mm -hmm. is... Um, uh, and, and this is one of the ways that I argue I'm still a new player. Mm -hmm. A lot of you are going to be coming into this set being like, oh, these are brand new cards. We've never seen these before. We've never seen these interactions. That's how I feel about the majority of cards still. Yeah. So for me, this is almost like a, I'm going to be getting excited about new cards without understanding any of their structural yeah. interactions with the rest of the game, and I'm really excited for that. Well, and I mean, also, I think this is very important as your next step as a new player, because it's, while, uh, like, card evaluation is important, it's not important in the sense, in my opinion, of, like, this card is strong. Yeah. I don't think that is actually an important part of card evaluation when you're just learning. I think the most important part of card evaluation when you're just learning is being like, ooh, I want to try that here. Because trying is the best way to learn in this game, right? So... Um, we're going to talk about the five new investigators as well, and I have four cards from each of the classes that we're going to be talking oh, about I'm today. Excited for new so, investigators! Yeah, they're they're pretty cool. So why don't we dive in with our first guy, which is Wilson Richards. This MF -er is from the Guardian class and has threes across the board for his stat line. He has uh, his ability is reduce the first uh, re reduce the resource cost of the first tool asset you play each round by one. And you get plus one skill value during skill tests on tool assets. So really this guy kind of has four in his, all of his stats, but you just don't get them all the time. His Elder Sign effect is plus zero. You may swap a tool asset in your play area with a tool asset in your hand with an equal or lower printed cost. Uh, his deck size is 30. He runs tool cards zero to five, guardian zero to four, neutral zero to five, and up to five other improvised and or upgrade cards level zero to one. So it's a, it's a big deck building pool and also one that as a new player is gigantic. But as a guardian, he doesn't get his fives. No, he doesn't get his five. So uh, he replaces his uh, guardian zero five with tool zero five. Interesting. So he can do tools from any class. He can just play like, he's kind of just going to be like a big grab bag. Yeah. Uh, his signature is called ad hoc. It's a two cost improvised upgrade event. It's uh, attach it to a tool or weapon asset you control as a reaction. After resolving an action ability on attached asset, exhaust ad hoc and discard a tool or weapon asset from your hand and resolve an action ability on the discarded asset, ignoring all costs. So this guy, fiddly enough, is kind of like a toolbox kind of deck. You know, you're going to be grabbing tools, throwing tools away. You're not going to get too committed to anything, which is pretty sweet. Uh, hasty repairs is his weak a weakness. It goes into your threat area while triggering abilities on assets you control, so your base skill value to zero. Um, notably, I think you still get the plus one skill value during skill tests. I think you do. Yeah, because it's specifying base skill Yeah, so your value. base skill goes to zero. It doesn't say it cannot be modified. Yeah, so, Yeah, so you've still got a two then. No, you'll still have a one. Oh, yeah. Right, I mean, right. unless the tool gives you plus one or yeah. something. Yeah. Because the tool can still give you its bonuses. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a double action to discard hasty repairs. That's actually not a bad weakness. No, it's actually pretty mild. It's a pretty mild weakness. Yeah. Like, I think his... Um, I think a, a mild weakness is kind of okay for this guy because his um, printed ability is kind of... It's not hyper-focused, no. right? And if you had, like, a crippling weakness, it could be pretty bad. However, I, I think this guy has potential to be pretty cool. Like, I think also, like... I mean, he seems like a great flex. Yeah, you know? and eight, eight body, six brain is also yeah. not bad for what I've seen of Guardians so far. Like, mm -hmm. that's enough brain to not get yigged too badly. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, what do you think of this guy, just generally? Does he interest you as an investigator? I, okay, I hate, I hate to admit it, I hate his face. His face is perfect, yeah. but I also hate it. Yeah. Uh, I want him smiling, and then he immediately becomes Gomez Adams to me, and sure. I want to play that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I actually really do like the character, and I really do want to play him as well. Mostly because tool cards level 0 to 5 feels like it could potentially be really powerful if you know what the other investigators are building for and you know what your role is. Mm -hmm. The fact that this guardian can effectively be with tools, and I don't know how extensive those deck pools are, mm -hmm. but you can effectively be any other class. Yes, yeah, is yeah. really fascinating to me. Yeah. Uh, and then he also gets improvised and upgrade cards. A lot of upgrade cards are in guardian. Yeah. Uh, already. A lot of improvised cards, you're going to see those in survivor a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But like... uh. I'm really curious because I, I want to see like what you can do with ad hoc, right? Being able to just like get additional free actions, I think is really cool. He also has economy built into his kit with reducing the tool cost of yeah, the first tool he plays true, by one, um, which I think is pretty sick. Um, there's, I always have the hardest time knowing how, so like there's a card called Sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a level four version that is three actions. You get like plus five and deal plus five damage. Um, but it costs you three actions, so it's like the puzzle to figure out. But I'm pretty sure, and I could be wrong, because I always, once again, I forget how this goes, but because you get to resolve an action ability uh, on an attached asset, ignoring all costs, I think you can discard the sledgehammer and then use it to attack something, which oh, seems really fun. That seems phenomenal. Yeah. I will also say, just speaking from experience, mm -hmm. having three book and three run... Mm -hmm. And three brain, like the three fight is the weakest to me, but the rest of them are enough that even if you're in a different role, you can still scoop up that one clue from mm -hmm. a low shroud location at a, a bad chance, but, yeah. but a chance. And three foot, there have been so many times in this Yig campaign where I've been like, I've got two foot. I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or I've got the equivalent of two foot where like you just, you have to do an evade because everything fell apart and the system is not working the way it should. Yeah. And you just, you just even want to be up that plus one yeah. just to slightly even your odds. And so I almost find the three across the board with the plus one from tool assets almost, especially with ad hoc being like, cause I wonder, does ad hoc technically trigger the tool assets ability as well? If it's just, so you, you trigger the tool it's attached to and then you can trigger another tool by discarding it. And when you trigger the discarded tool, does it get the plus one from tool assets? Yeah, see, this feels really good to me. Yeah. This is like, this is like at any time I can have a four and a skill yes. as long as I've got the right balance and that feels good. And also like to go with what you say about even like, when I say like he's really good at flexing, the three book's really nice, but you just give this guy a, a lantern, which I'm pretty sure is a tool in his offhand. Um, what that does is you can investigate at minus one shroud, which means you're now investigating at four four versus the game so you're really investigating at five so it's very easy to like never have a dead turn with wilson richards yeah and like dead turns are like not like they're not going to cause you to lose the game but they're going to feel like you're not like progressing the game as much as you should oh i've definitely felt that yeah um yeah no i actually really like him i just wish he was smiling yeah <laughs> all right uh let's go to our first of the four guardian cards we got ancestral token this is a three cost accessory soaks for two horror after you defeat an enemy, exhaust Ancestral Token and add Blessed Tokens to the Chaos Bag equal to that enemy's printed health to a max of 5. So you're playing Curses right now in your Luke Robinson deck. We're also going to try to be as spoiler-free for our campaign, just because I know pe people, they, they, they love the Eric campaign, so we don't Aww, want to thank too you. much. Um, I'm just trying my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, but So you're doing Curse Tokens in that deck. Um, a big problem with Blessed Tokens... Not a big problem. Blessed tokens is still very viable, but like it's easy to put curse tokens in the cup because mm -hmm. they're like a they're a downside, quote unquote downside. Yeah. But because blessed tokens were seen as an upside, there was not a lot of way to put blessed tokens into the bag, and this is like a really good way to put blessed tokens into the bag. I mean, I think this is a phenomenal card. I think I think depending on who you are, this potentially. Um... Like, I don't think it fully replaces, what was that, Rosary Beads? Holy Rosary. Holy Rosary. But the fact that it's also got Brain Soak, the mm -hmm. fact that it's an amulet location, and the fact that it doesn't discard itself when it does what it does. Yes. I really like this. Yeah. So, yeah, the nice thing now is that it also gives you choices. Um, for example, um, there's a new investigator, Parallel Zoe. Um, she has the ability that whenever you deal damage, you put a blessed token in the bag. You can do it once per phase. And once per round, you can remove three blessed tokens to um, 
deal an extra damage to her new attack. Oh. So it's a nice ability. But her problem was that you kind of just had to play Holy Rosary 2, which gives you plus one brain, and if you succeed on a treachery, a will test on a treachery, you get to put two blessed tokens in. Yeah. What this does is now it gives her an item she can use instead of that, but Holy Rosary 2 is still viable in a lot of decks that aren't killing enemies. No, right? and, and with, with Zoe, you could run both of them. You could feasibly run both of yeah. them, yeah, yeah. I also love that it's no experience. Yes, it's a level zero card, yeah. I like that that allows it to flex. Like, the, the cost, I think, is what's making up for that. That three is kind of big. Yeah, I agree with that. But I like that it means that anyone who has access to the Guardian Pool is going to, and who wants to run a Bless deck, could potentially use this if they're planning on killing monsters. Yeah, the thing I'm curious to see of how this evolves is, is this worth it in uh, a deck that's not killing monsters? That, no, that's not doing Bless tokens, sorry. Yeah. Like, if, like... Because I don't think just a random blessed token is worth it. No. Likewise, uh, like, well, I don't think curses cause you to fail. I don't think blesses commonly will cause you to pass. So I'm curious to see how this one evolves with them. But I do think the card is pretty, pretty nice. So this is a thing that uh, came out of my time as a banker. And I'll, I'll be really brief on it. But mm -hmm. there was a, we, we came to realize of, uh, basically that the bank I was working at had rigged the thing against us. Mm -hmm. Where um, they only noted as a success when we got, uh, when we got a rating of exceptional service. Mm -hmm. And they only noted as a failure when we got a rating of uh, terrible service. Mm -hmm. but, but good service, they treated as a neutral. Mm -hmm. And what it meant was that because we got more good services than we got... Um, uh, excellent services. We were actually, they were actually setting us up in a system where we were kind of programmed to fail unless mm. we were constantly pushing for excellent service. Because if you got more goods, it watered down the excellent. Yeah, it makes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way that they were rating it was we don't care if you fail, we care how often you succeed. Yeah. And so statistically, it watered down the yeah, number yeah. of successes we got. And that's kind of how I feel about Bless and Chaos Tokens. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have a plus one negative effect, but when you're drawing that, what you in in the bag, there's usually only a couple of tokens you really want to draw. Yep. Uh, I mean, not like like you're very good at that. You're very good at being like, okay, I'm ready for the minus five. Yeah. But for someone who often isn't, yeah. I have a larger pool of tokens I don't want to draw than tokens I do want to draw. Mm -hmm. And drawing more tokens doesn't feel like it's improving my chances. Yeah, and I think I think that's uh, overall I think a very very fair way of looking at it. It's like it, it's the same thing with cursed tokens. Like that's like kind of the thing. Like cursed tokens don't necessarily lower your chances. Yeah. Right. Because, like, if you're up two and you draw a curse token into a zero, you wanted to draw the zero anyway. The curse token did nothing. It just, made, fact, you, just made you spend more calories, right? <laughs> yeah. And it also it also literally got rid of... And, and, and here's the other difference, too, is, like, when you draw a curse token and then you still succeed, you're up. Mm -hmm. You paid curse token as a cost yeah. to put a negative into the bag, which you then drew for no cost to mm -hmm. you, and you succeeded. Yeah. If you draw a blessed token and then into a failure, you've wasted... Three resources. Well, you've wasted more resources. Yeah. And likewise, as well, if you if you drew a bless and still passed, you actually also didn't really spend any of your re you didn't spend your resources well. Yeah, that's the strange thing about curse tokens. But I do think that they have, I think, figured this out more for this one because this is the second cycle with bless and curse tokens. Um, so I'm curious to see how it goes. Keeping it going, we got Ofuda. This is a two cost item charm bless asset. It uses one charge and you replenish this charge the first time a bless token is revealed at your location each round. As a lightning bolt, you can chose a non-elite enemy or location and spend a charge. That enemy loses alert, aloof, elusive, and retaliate until the end of the round. It loses all of them, you don't choose. So a uh, quick refresher for Eric and for people who might not know, alert, if you fail and evade against it, it attacks you. Aloof, you need to, it, it won't automatically engage you. Um, elusive, like it, it'll be like aloof, it'll just be hanging out on the location. Elusive is a new keyword where if you deal damage to it or it attacks you, it's going to disengage and move to a connecting location. And then we got retaliate, which is if you fail an attack against it, it attacks you. Now, I'm unfortunately a white person who doesn't always know the difference, but this is feeling very... Um, uh, Southeast Asia slash Japanese. There is, in its... there is a new Japanese character. I was hoping yeah, so. There's okay, a new I Japanese love it. character. So that the, the, the all the stuff is kind of going with that. Yeah. So I don't know how I feel about this item mm -hmm. because I really love its power and its power is absolutely clutch. How often is it going to trigger though? Right. That's kind of like where we are. Yeah, and yeah. also like, and I get why it only has one charge. Mm -hmm. 
And it's nice that it replenishes if you draw blessed tokens. So I don't know. I don't know if maybe you build a Zoe deck that just supercharges no. the amount of blessed tokens you're revealing at your location each mm -hmm. round. Because like with that trigger off of Zoe's ability to re with to reveal three. No, because you're removing them. You're removing them. Yeah. See, I don't know. I don't know how often this is going to recharge, which means I don't know how often I'm going to actually use it. Yeah, I think that's kind of like where I am too with this card because I think the effect is really good. I think that this is going to live in blessed decks. Obviously, it's not just going to be a card you put in. If it cost like one and was fast, I could see me putting this in a deck that I did, but it's two cost and an action. Um, but the ability to just like, I'm kind of like treating this, there's a card called Riot Whistle, yeah. which uh, you can use, it takes up your accessory slot and you can get a free engage each turn. I kind of treat this as like right now, my theory crafting is a slotless Riot Whistle. I'm using this to actually just engage aloof enemies. Because that's kind of like how I'm looking at it. Oh. Um, I don't know if that's good. We also have to see how um, much elusive. I think elusive is a great keyword, and I hope it, it's like we'll see how it carries on through future expansions as well. But I, I agree. I, I need to see this one in practice before I know how much it's going to uh, recharge. Because I'd almost want it better as an event. Yes. And I mean, yeah. I've been playing a lot of event heavy decks mm -hmm. recently, or at least a lot of uh, a lot of decks that rely on event to get out of sticky situations. But this feels weird to do a setup and then just hope it plays out. Like maybe for someone like you who has a lot of knowledge about each, mm -hmm. like you know that there's more aloof enemies or there's yeah. alert enemies in uh, or that damn age. snake is showing up yeah. at some point. Yeah. And then this is useful to have, but for everybody else, it's like, oh. I do view this as a tech card. Yeah. It's very yeah. much a tech card. Uh, and good news. There is a, there's an event that does this in mystic. So yes. <laughs> I don't think it's that playable though. That's the, that, oh, no. that's why I actually think this one's better. So the card is mind wipe. Mm -hmm. Why I think this card is better is because you can use it multiple times. And, like, it doesn't take up your hand slot when you play it. But is it worth the action? We're going to have to see when it all goes. But I think it is a tech card. And I think tech cards are important. It's like sideboarding. Excuse me, you can sideboard against a campaign. All right, next up, we got Tinker. This is a one-cost, level zero event. It's an insight and an upgrade. Fast play only during your turn. Attach Tinker to an add tool asset in your play area. Limit one per asset. Attached asset takes up one fewer hand slot or accessory slot. Wow, that seems good. Hand slots are um are like they're they're good. Hand slots are a very powerful slot in this game. There is a, a rogue kind of equivalent to this. It's called uh I'll take that. And it's good. It's where you so after you investigate or evade an enemy. No, no, sorry, it's hidden pocket. That's the card. You uh you attach it to an item as you control, and you have one additional hand slot for illicit items. Um and it's playable in the right deck, and I think it's the same kind of thing for this, right? If you're a tool deck, you're probably going to want to play this. And, and I mean, just think of it this way, too, is like, if you play two of this in your deck, you could end up with four tools in play at any time. And if you're that that Wilson fellow, yep. that's wild. Yes. Um, I like that it's fast. Yep. I'm okay with it being play only during your turn. I think that's... That, that happens a lot on um, events. So if yeah. there was ever... Because the fast event doesn't like it's if it didn't say that you could play it during lightning bolts mm -hmm. so that's gonna that's pretty common on fast events yeah um i actually i and you'll have to tell me do you think it's um do you think it's that important that they put it as uh limit one per asset like how powerful would it be to have a two-handed asset become a zero-handed asset like realistically um it would be probably pretty good um but i think the only reason it's it's limit one per asset is because it's level zero. Because mm. there is a bandolier, which takes up your body slot, gives you two additional hand slots for weapon assets. So it's just like, I think that that's priced out at level zero. Do Oh, no, no, this is a tool asset specifically. Okay. Uh, but I think the sledgehammer card that I was talking about is a tool. Yeah. So you could do that with it. I, I love this picture because I hate it so much. Why do you hate it? I don't understand. I don't understand why you would do that. So you could screw and wrench at the same time. We actually had this conversation when in our in our first <laughs> video about it. <laughs> All right, next up, our last guardian card. Not the last guardian card spoiled, but again, we're only doing four because we're already 20 minutes in and we're only on the first class, so we're killing it. <laughs> Hand-eye coordination. This is a one-cost, level one event. Fast play only during your turn. Resolve an action ability on a tool or weapon as you control without paying its action cost. Um, does action cost include discarding the item? No, unless of no, 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 no. It, it, yeah, there was a there was a wording for it where it was like ignoring all costs, but this one is actually just its action cost, so you That's will fair. still have to discard it. 
seems okay. Seems okay. Uh, free actions are good. Yeah. Uh, is it worth one experience and, an, uh, and, a, and a card in your deck? Remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that, like, um, this is, once again, for Sledgehammer, you, you ignore its action cost. And I think that can, like, once again, I'm so bad on knowing when it doesn't and when it does not cause all three actions, right? Um, because it's tough. I, I, have to, I have to do more homework on that. That's my new personal goal for 2024. Um, but... Yeah, I'm curious to see how this one goes. All right, do you want to see the Seeker Investigator? I do. All right, we got Kate Winthrop, and she's got a lot of cards. So Kate Winthrop, 2424 two, four for her stats. You begin the game with a Flux stabler, Stabilizer inactive side face up. So why don't we just go look at the inactive Flux Stabilizer down to the bottom. Permanent, forced. After a clue is placed on Flux Stabilizer, search your bonded cards to discard pile for one copy of Aetheric Current and shuffle it into your deck, and then flip the Flux Stabilizer. When it's flipped... It's when you place a clue on a nasty control, get plus two skill value for your next skill test this phase. Hopping back up to Kate Winthrop up top. Lightning Bolt. Move a clue from Kate Winthrop to a science or tool asset you control with no clues on it. So basically you get like unexpected um, courages whenever you on your investigator card. Uh, you get it once per science or tool unless that clue goes away. Forced, when an asset you control with a clue on it leaves play, you place uh, its clue on your location, which is nice. Um, because it, uh, means that, you know, there's risks to losing your stuff, but it's not too bad. Because mm -hmm. you can only still place one clue on an asset. Unless you discard, like, everything, it's not that bad. I also like that it means that you're not potentially destroying clues. Yes. And, and also, as well, um, you can spend clues on your item assets. You still are clues you control. Yeah. Uh, her Elder Sign Effect is plus zero. Oh, really? Zero. Yes. Yeah. So they don't, because, because oh. a, a lot of clue counts are actually pretty precise in scenarios. So they're, like, actually, like, that's all you get. Yeah. Uh, I will sign effect is plus zero. You may move one clue from nasty control back to Kate Winthrop. So basically, you just get another unexpected courage. Her deck building is 30, Seeker 0 to 5, Science 0 to 4, and Insight cards 0 to 1. Her other signatures, Aetheric Current. So there's two of these, and these are what you'll shuffle into your deck when you place a clue on Flux Stabilizer. Um... After clues placed on flip switch bonded cards, you just go power for one copy of their current shuffle into your back. When you place a clue on this control, the plus two skill. How do you flip it back? I don't think you do. I think it's only if you remove a clue. It doesn't say that. Oh. So maybe you only get one per scenario. Or maybe I'm just missing something. Anyway, we got Yuggeth. So you only get to play if its active side is face up. Um, that would that would make sense though. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't want to have to spend multiple clues to keep activating your power. Yeah. So it's probably that you just have to invest that first one. Ah, uh, no, it's on it's on the events. There we oh, go. Here so we go. for this attack, you may uh, fight. Move all clues on assets you control to Kate Winthrop. For this attack, you may use book instead of fist. If you succeed and the attacked enemy is non elite, you may exhaust it and move it to any location. Draw a card and flip flux stabilizer. <laughs> and we got Yoth. Evade. Move all clues on Atsy Control. You may use book instead of foot. If you succeed, the target of this evasion is not only shuffle into the encounter deck, draw a card, flip flux stabilizer. So those are those are good effects. Those are good effects. Uh, so notably, though, you don't get them immediately. You do need to get clues, shuffle them into your deck, but you can also recur them. And then her weakness, her signature weakness is failed experiment, test brain three. This test gets plus one difficulty for each asset you control with a clue on it. For each point you fail by, you must either take a horror or place one of your clues on your location. So pretty, yeah, pretty tough. She does have a lot of brain soak. Mm -hmm. Um, but Travis, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Eric, you gonna say, but Travis, what do you think? Eric, what do you think of, uh, Kate Winthrop? I think this is my favorite character. Oh yeah? You like Kate? Yeah. I think this is a big flavor win. Mm -hmm. I think that I want to get deep into the nitty gritty on, um, how to use Flex Stabilizer as aggressively as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and have a science and tool asset. Um, I love the, the, now do you have to, do you have to run with both Aetheric Currents or just one? They're bonded. Okay. So they're actually set aside mm -hmm. and you can choose which one you want when you activate the Flux Stabilizer. I absolutely love that. Yeah. Um, this is, this feels to me like the most fun I could ever have with the Seeker class mm -hmm. because I've turned clues into an additional resource set mm -hmm. that you have mm -hmm. said does not get away from my action as a cluever. Yeah, yeah. I love this character. I love science cards zero to four, insight level zero to one, uh, neutral zero to five. I love this deck building. <laughs> Everything about her is, I think she is my favorite character. Whether she's strong, I don't know, but I love the concept. Yeah, the flavor of her is really cool. 
Uh, the big problem right now with science, we have to see the rest of the expansion, is it's mostly seeker cards. <laughs> so it's like she can play them anyway for the most part. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so I'm hoping, but like the thing about trait based deck building is that it can just suddenly change in a, an expansion. Yeah. There was one investigator, Rita Rita Young, who was pretty not great for a while, but then she got she can play tricks from zero to three, and there was a dra a great trick in a guardian class, and it basically just improved her stock Amazing. immensely. So like, there's huge growth potential in trait based deck building. Yeah, I think she's cute. I wanted her. I made a whole video. So we actually spoiled her backside. Um, uh, we, I made a whole video about how I wished she was the Seeker Rogue. 05 Seeker, 02 Rogue. And then they gave us the backside, which I thought was uh, very funny. <laughs> Maybe just a coincidence. Like, who knows? But I'm glad that we got to spoil her backside after I made that video. So I'm glad you like her so much. Because, oh, I, I mean, like, her. the Aether Occurrence are powerful cards. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to try her out, too. But I'm just excited for more Arkham. All right, let's get to some secret cards. We got Chemistry Set. This is a two-cost item tool science. Takes up the accessory slot. Exhaust it to investigate. If you fail by exactly two, discard Chemistry Set. If you succeed by exactly zero, gain two resources. If you succeed by exactly two, draw a card. If you succeed by exactly four, discover one additional clue at your location. I'm, I'm sorry, we have gambling in the sciences now? Is <laughs> yeah, that what well, I'm seeing? This is actually why I wanted her to be Seeker Rogue, because this was spoiled at the same time, and I'm like, this feels incredibly rogue. But it also, like, does feel science-y, right? Where it's like, um, you don't really, like, you're mixing concoctions, you don't really know what's going to come out, right? Yeah. So it does, it does flavorfully fit. Yeah. You're testing a hypothesis. Yeah. I love this card. Mm-hmm. I find it hilarious that you wear it around your neck, given how big it is. Yeah. I'm just picturing that woman walking around now with a yeah. <laughs> desk cabinet. Uh, but I think it's great. Mm -hmm. I actually like it, too, because it's um, it's just an investigate action. Yep. Um, and you can you can try to program for it. Yeah, yeah. And you also, just like, you basically just don't want to fail by exactly two. Yeah. Like, yeah. if you fail by one, fail by three, if you succeed by one or three, you're still probably, like, if you succeed, you're still getting a clue. Yeah. You're just not getting extra value out of it. It taking the accessory slot is, like, probably makes it playable. I think if it took the hand size, not hand slot, no. not many people would play it. Um, but it is an item tool science for Kate. Yep. It is an item tool science. It okay. is. Yep. Which gets you that plus two on your investigate action. It does, yeah. Yeah, maybe that's enough to draw a card. Yeah. Or discover one additional clue. Yeah. That actually seems the weakest to me, to be honest. Uh, it's really good, but I don't know if... I think you're right, because I don't know if it's worth it to... Like, what you're putting to get up by that much, just like you're getting enough clues already, right? Yeah. You're just like, you're, you're probably doing pretty good. My favorite is actually the succeed by exactly zero. Yeah. Just gaining two resources is very powerful. That's the one I'm aiming for. Yeah. Like every yeah. time I see that or drawing a cart, but like, I also feel that those two are much more realistic in the way that the game rolls. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We got Dr. Charles West III. This MFR knows his purpose. He is a three cost ally science. So you can put a clue on him. Um, he takes up the ally slot, so for one and two. You have one additional hand slot, which can only be used to hold a tool asset. And then after you successfully investigate by exactly one or three, exhaust Dr. Charles West the third to deal one damage to an enemy at your location. He's creepy, and he's I love evil, him. He's evil, isn't he? He's, he's actually evil. He's straight up evil. Yeah. I, I, I was hoping that he'd have some sort of sacrifice mechanic after saying knows his purpose, because yeah. let's be real. Um, three for that ability... I don't know how I feel about that. Mm -hmm. I like I think three for his one additional hand slot is great, but I actually feel that his um, free ability on mm -hmm. the bottom, which is probably driving up his price a bit, uh, isn't great. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. I think this guy this guy has the seeker ally problem where they have the best ally in the game, and everyone else you're just like I'll just play Doctor Milan, <laughs> you know. It's, I feel like he's there for your weird wheel of stone. Like, did, did the creators watch your weird stone no. man video? Because that's what this feels like. Yeah, but even then, like, it's just like, it's, you don't, it's, I mean, like, I don't know. He's just, he's, he doesn't seem great. No. You know? Not for that price. If he was two, he'd be too strong. I think if he was two, I, I, two for the additional hand slot is really nice. Mm -hmm. I'd play him at two. Three's, three's a hard sell, but I'd probably play this guy at two. I mean, I'm going to play him at three. I have to play him. Yeah. I need to know how he actually works. Legally, you are required to um, as the creator of this channel. It's true, I am. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> I've signed a blood pact. Uh, by the exactly one or three, I'm curious, like, because I think if it does trigger, that is nice. 
But like, it, you need to have like the perfect situation. There needs to be an enemy. You need to go first. The enemy has to not be with you. You need to um, fucking succeed by one or three. I don't know. It just seems a lot for a thing that's gonna like you're gonna trigger it like twice in a campaign, and you're gonna be like, why isn't this anything else? You know, I almost wonder if there is if they are trying to now force an opposite to the maybe the reason why she's not a rogue is because they're actually not trying to get you to win by big numbers. Yeah, this is exact numbers. They want you to try and be really finicky with the numbers. I, I can see that one hundred percent being the case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Science, finicky right. with the numbers. Speaking of science, we got a microscope. So this is a two cost asset, item tool science takes up a hand slot. As a reaction after enemy location is successfully evaded or defeated, exhaust the microscope to place one resource on it as evidence. Oh. Which the flavor of that is actually pretty good. Yeah. Double action investigate, you get plus one book for this investigation for each evidence on microscope to a max of plus three. If you succeed, you may spend up to two evidence to discover that many additional clues at your location. The reason why this is actually a flavor fail is because every time I use this card, I'm going to pretend like I'm holding the microscope at the base, and when I trip someone, I'm going to be like, chick, chick. <laughs> um, This is... This feels really good. It's interesting. Because, yeah. um, I mean, I think like I think the text is good, but then you have to remember what, I, what I'm trying to, like, what I remind myself about this card. I think the two cost is... Fair. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything on its own. Um, I mean, it does give you plus one for two actions, which is not worth it. No. Um, but what it does do is that you need to, I think, you need to spend... Um, you need to spend two evidence. Yeah. You don't want to spend one unless it's going to win you the game. Hmm. Because two actions for two clues... Oh, no, you're right. Is, is, I mean, it's not terrible. It's not a bad rate. But I think you can actually do better, right? Um, but... Two actions for three clues. Now I'm a, now I'm interested. Well, especially if you combine this with I think who it's obviously built for, which is uh, our scientist, mm -hmm. where she can drop a drop a clue on this, automatically pump it to what was it plus two? Yeah, for plus an two action. for her test. Yeah, and then you spend all your evidence to gain the additional yeah. clues. But even then, I got to admit, having played the poison curse deck, where it's just like gain another clue at your location, mm -hmm. I don't feel this is fast enough. It, I mean, I think so. It depends on how much you can trigger the ability. Yeah. So, like, for example, if you are locked, if you are able to get evade an enemy every turn, you can um, get evidence a lot quicker that way. Yeah. Right. So I guess that's the question, right? Like, you get one a turn every three turns. If you evade an enemy every three turns, but you also don't need to do the evading or defeating. That's right? true. Like, if you're glued to your goon, your goon can kill things. You can then just, like, every three turns get an additional, like, clue. That's true. That's true. But is that enough? I mean, I think for level zero, I think so. I think this card will be playable. Is that enough for a hand slot, though? Uh, I do think so, because a lot of the time in Seeker, you're kind of just playing magnifying glasses. Okay. <laughs> which is, like, the one of the best cards in the game. But you can, like, hold a mag... Because, like, that's where I look... So Magnifying Glass gives you plus one book while investigating. It's cost one and it's fast. Card's insane. Um, would I want to spend two actions to get two clues or just investigate twice with my Magnifying Glass and pass both those things and do the same thing for a lot less? That's like what it's competing with with me. If I look at it from a pure spike perspective, yeah. right? Which I do. I, I, I do try to like look from every angle when I do this one. But I think the card is cool. I think it could definitely have a home. Um... Yeah. 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 All Wilson right. might have fun with it. Wilson could have fun with it. Yeah. It does sound pretty fun. Yeah, you could throw it away to get the investigate ability. Uh, you know for what? One That's act. kind of fun. Yeah, you know, he's holding the tool, killing enemies with his other hand. <laughs> yeah, and, and then, then he just, just fucking like... throws away a microscope to be like, by the way, I picked up. Yeah. I mean, I guess you wouldn't actually want to throw it away, but yeah, still. But still, it could be in play, yeah. Yeah. All right, our last secret card for this video, we got Control Variable. This is a one cost event. Nice and simple. Fast. Player from an investigator reveals a curse token during a skill to your location. Discover a clue your location. Do you want this in your loop deck? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think this card is a great card for cursed decks. I wouldn't play it otherwise. It's good though. I think in cursed decks. Yeah, yeah. I don't not think in every cursed deck, but like in your loop deck, this card would be killer. It would also be fun to throw into a, a, any sort of a flex <coughs> curse deck. Yep. Uh, because it allows you to just scoop a clue without doing a shroud test. Yeah. I also like this as um, mitigation for curses because yeah. like. Um, Whenever someone's playing a curse deck, I'm going to buy Blasphemous or False Covenant just because it makes my life easier. Um, and this is just another way for you to do that, right? Like if you were playing a curse rogue deck, I'll be like, yeah, I'll, I'll put this in my deck, yeah. right? Just maybe get some extra value out of it. It probably won't last until scenario eight in those kind of decks, but in a curse deck, I think it would. Cool card though. 
All right, good to move on? We're, let's go. All right, our rogue investigator, we got Alessandra Zorzi. She is the drifter socialite. She soaks her seven and seven, and she loves a good party, according to her uh, quote there. Three, four, two, four. You may take an additional action during a turn, which can only be used to parlay. Her Elder Sign effect is plus two. If you succeed, choose a non elite enemy or location or revealed connecting location, automatically evade that enemy. Her deck building is Rogue 05, cards with Parlay 05, and Neutral 05. Her signature is Beguile. It's a two cost event. You get um, three of these, by the way, in your deck. Uh, it's fast, play only during your turn. Attach Beguile to a non elite enemy or your location as an action Parlay. Either move attached enemy to a revealed connecting location or perform a basic investigate or evade action at its location. If you fail a skill test resolving this ability, discard Beguile. You may activate this ability from any location. Her signature weakness is Zamakona. He's elusive, so that keyword again. Uh, spawn nearest empty location if able. He cannot be, you cannot parlay with Zamakona. And, well, Alessandra can't. Someone else could. Uh, he'll talk to uh, Monterey Jack, but won't talk to Alessandra. <laughs> Force, the first time Alessandra Zorzi parlays each round, you place one Doom on Zamakona. I always find it such an interesting flavor choice, and I kind of love it when criminals could potentially show up in the, like, edge of space and time and just ruin your game by just being like, ah, I'm a human criminal, what am I doing there, here? There's a, a joke, um, and it's such a flavor, like, win on the ridiculous side of it. It's Stubborn Detective, it's a basic weakness. And the name Stubborn Detective, this man will follow you into, like... Anywhere. Into lost in time and space, and he'll show up being like, I got you now, Monterey Jack! You know? I like the weakness. I actually think it's potentially very scary. I agree. But you can also avoid it. Just by just by hopefully being in a position where you can either get rid of him first yeah. or not activate Beguile. Like, it's very much you get to choose how this goes. Yeah, but also, because you want to parlay, your whole deck's going to be filled with parlay cards. That That's we're true. Gonna see. I'm actually very curious because he does seem powerful. He also is a 3-3-3 for his stat line. That's hard for a rogue with two fists to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's, he's tough. Like, when he pops up, you want to be like... Help. Yeah, goon, help me. And he also has elusive, so when you deal damage, he'll run away from you. Yeah. It's a cool card. You gotta you gotta really eliminate him in one go. Um, I don't know enough about parlay, yeah, so I really can't weigh in. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of parlay cards that we're gonna be uh, that have been spoiled in the set because this is like one of the most common custom investigators that people make is the investigator that parlays. And finally the game has it. Um, so we have some cards that we can talk about, but you're going to see more of these as we go. This is kind of where I sit too. Her ability is going to depend entirely on how good she parlays and if she has fine clothes. Five clo fine clothes is a one cost asset. You've actually played it or you've seen me play I've it. I've seen you play it. Uh, and it soaks for one and one and it reduces the difficulty of parlay test by two. So with your parlay on Beguile, that's really nice, right? Because now yeah. it's re reduced by two, but it's a lot of pieces to come together. Here is the first parlay card we got. This is Grift, a zero cost event. Parlay, choose an, oh, parlays never provoke attacks of opportunity either. Oh, good to know, yeah. okay, thank you. Uh, choose an enemy or location and test foot zero. For each point you succeeded by, gain one resource to a maximum of six. If you fail, that enemy attacks you. Incredible, that would go so well also in your gambling in my, deck. In my skids deck, yes. Yeah. I, I would kill for this card in my deck for a lot of reasons. Number one, big money now. Big money now. Number two, it's a zero test. It's a zero test. Yeah, which is uh, game-breaking. You can potentially do a lot of gross things with it. If you're playing without a taboo list, which we are for this run, so I could definitely do gross things with this card in my deck. Good card. It's it's a very interesting card. Yeah. 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 I also like that if you fail, the enemy attacks, attacks you. Yeah, because you're grifting the fucker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. False Surrender. This is a one-cost tactic trick event. Parlay. Choose an enemy location and play a weapon asset from your hand, reducing its cost by one. You may then take a fight action with the, that weapon against the chosen enemy using foot instead of the skill indicated. This is a very interesting card. Are there, is there a character who uses foot instead of Uh, No. Fist? So there's... Well, rogues have high foot. Yeah. Right? So, like, that's, like, for example, Winifred Habamuck. If you're a Winifred fighting deck, she has, like, three fists but five foot. So you can use this to basically get plus two to a test. Notably, the weapon doesn't give you the fist boost because you're just using your foot, right? Yeah. Um, this is one that I think that, like, is interesting. I don't know if it's good or not. Um, 
But there's a lot of rogue cards that like care when stuff comes into play, mm -hmm. and it could change the thing. Rogues have a lot of skill cards that commit for foot icons. Um, but it's strange because it costs one. We, I, no one really knows why it costs one, but it reduces the cost of the item you're playing by one, as opposed to, it's like, because you're not actually getting a resource reduction there. Yeah. Um, you also don't take the fight action with it. Like, you don't have to take the fight action. You may then yeah. take a fight action with that weapon, yeah. Like, maybe if you want to use your fist, but not your foot. It's a very strange card. I see your point now, though, actually. If you're, a, if you're like a Guardian Rogue Splash, this can be an easy way to fast, to not fast out, but to play out a weapon. And because it's parlay, it's not an attack of opportunity. Yeah. There's a sort of somewhat similar card. It's called Motivational Speech. Uh, it's a parlay. An uh, investigator location can play an ally at reduced cost of three. Um, and it actually is. It's a, it's a way to play an ally asset without getting attacked. And I'm curious if it's the same for this. I have to see this one in action. Maybe there's more cards that we haven't seen spoiled yet that also boost it. But I think this might... My prediction potentially is this might be a plant for a future investigator that uses their foot to fight or something mm. like that. Yeah. This is also one of the most gorgeous art. Mm -hmm. It's nice. That they've released in a while, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Whoever did the colors on this is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. All right. We got Blackmail File. This is a two-cost asset, item tome illicit. Parlay is an action. Choose a non only enemy location and parlay. Test Brain X, where X is the enemy's printed health value. If you succeed, that enemy disengages from each investigator and gains aloof until the end of the round. Okay, but I now want you to... I, everyone, please sit down, pause your video um, and after I'm done talking, and I want you to replace this bearded old man with every non-elite enemy in the game <laughs> that you can think of sitting there in that exact pose. Yeah. Because that's the, that's the flavor of this. So, funny story... Um, this is an old art from the Call of Cthulhu game. Oh, I love that. But the guy in the original art had black hair and no beard. So they have actually edited this to be the lawyer character, George Barnaby, for the future. I love it. Which is very interesting. It's very interesting. Um, but yeah, it is. You're basically blackmailing, like, a, a conglomeration of spheres. Like a gl like a gug. It's just yeah. like, oh, you got me. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> Don't send those pics to my wife. Yeah, please. Uh, it was, it was, it was a moment of weakness at the gug <laughs> at my gug friend's bachelor party. Please no. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. If the card's good, I don't think so. <laughs> no. I think the rogue <coughs> are not getting, like, the cards they've seen apart from, like, Grift, they're not that great in this cycle. So far what we've seen. Because, like, it's just so much of this. Rogue have bad brain. Mm -hmm. So, like, this is, like, for rogues who have high brain. And a lot of it also depends on if you, once again, have fine clothes or not in your hand. I also don't like how it's X. X yeah. is the enemy's printed health value. Printed health value. So this doesn't get easier the more you fight them. This doesn't get easier the more... There's very few things in the game that can influence an enemy's printed health value, as far as I can tell. There's actually only, I think, like, one. And I think it's Wither level four. Yeah. I think that's the only one that I can think of at the top of my head. Um, if I'm dealing with... And, and the other thing, too, is, like, if I'm dealing with a non elite enemy that is, like, three or less health, I'm kind of trusting the... Uh, the goon the goon to yeah. come in and deal a swift kill I like okay I like your working theory if this was like remaining health health because then like your goon could like put some damage on an enemy and you can be like okay go away yeah right like you could just be like I'm here to clean that up that would be a lot more interesting I mm -hmm. think that's cool and now it makes me sad that it's not that yeah I'm sorry no it's okay it's all good that's me. You on my back. I'll put him in the shoulder and be like, I'm sorry I ruined this card for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we got Vamp. Not Vampire, just Vamp. This is a one-cost event. It's a trick. Parlay. Choose an enemy location and test any skill three. If you succeed and you tested Brain, remove a Doom from that enemy. If you tested Book, discover a clear location. Foot, automatically evade that enemy if it's not elite, move it to a connecting location. And Fist, deal two damage to that enemy. This okay. is a good card. Yeah, I think this card's sweet. Um... Uh, my favorite mode is the fist, but that's just because I like killing things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love the discovering a clue. I love the removing a doom from that enemy. That's very clutch and certain. Yep. Definitely. But, but you don't need it. Yeah. I love that this does anything for everyone. What I like about this card is I... This card is going to become uh, 
a kill spell for me because like say for example you're fighting like a boss that has six attack you now basically are getting plus three to deal two damage to it it's yeah and it's not elite it's not a non-elite enemy yeah for the damage yeah so you're Which, just vamping at Cthulhu. Yeah, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's that's to me where I think this card really, really shines. I think it's a cool card, and I'm curious to see um, who plays it, what they discover with it, and all that kind of stuff. Well, and especially because like test fist three on any character who's has a good goon, fist. Yeah, yeah, you're that's what you want. Yep, yep. Terrible for spellcasters. Yeah, it's not great for spellcasters. I mean, I also like the evaded move. Is it's I maybe mean, one resource is actually like not much at all and i like that it's also automatically evade that enemy yeah not not if it's if it's a non-elite you move it but you can just evade an enemy yeah and it's also you don't have to be engaged with it either which is huge yeah yeah all right we're on to kohaku narukami this is the 4431 mystic scholar bless curse soaks for six and eight if there is a reaction at the start of your turn either add a bless or curse token to the chaos bag whichever there are fewer of in case of a tie you choose uh or remove two bless and two curse tokens to take an additional action this turn Elder Sign Effect is plus two, add a uh, token of each to the bag. His deck building is Blessed 05, Cursed 05, Occult Level 0, and Mystic 03. So he, once again, doesn't have Mystic all the way, but he does do Bless and Curse to the top. He has Book of Living Myths for his signature, two cost, as a reaction, takes up the hand slot, by the way. Reaction, when a Chaos token will be revealed to your location, exhaust Book of Living Myths. Search the Chaos Bag for a Curse or Bless token, whichever there are more of, in case of a tie you choose, and resolve it instead. Which is pretty sick. There's that revealed trigger we were looking for. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and then we got Weeping Your Eye. This is a 2-2-2, aloof, elusive, and hunter. Forced, after an investigator reveals a Bless or Curse token during a skill test at Weeping Your Eye's location, if it is ready, it attacks that investigator. Limit once per test. And that's two horror. That's not nothing. I love this character. Yeah, Kohaku's really cool. I love that he looks like young James. Yep, he does. Um, and I love... I, I'm very interested to know about the deck building because everything else about this character feels so strong, so I've got to imagine that the weakness is in the blessed, cursed, and the low mystic. I think it... I think what it does is it means that he has, like, a higher... a lower traditional mystic ceiling, but there is still good stuff in his pool. Yeah. Um... His stat line means that he can also, like, do book stuff really well. I do wish my... my They don't have a four-fight mystic, and I wish he was, like, 4-3-4 four, four instead of 4-4-3-1. Four, four, um, but he's cool. I think he's really cool, and I think he's going to be fun to play. And I love his weakness. Everything about it. Flavor, art, text, it's all just a win. A hundred percent. Yeah, he's cool. I he's almost he is strongly competing with the scientist for the you know, most exciting like investigator yeah, for me yeah, to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's so fascinating too. All right, well, we got some curse and bless cards in this. Uh, well, just curse ones actually that we can talk about in uh, the Mystic class. Let's see some four of them. First one we got here is the Wicked of Thane. I think this card's sick. Two cost item weapon melee cursed takes up the hand slot as an action. Add one to three curse tokens to the chaos bag to fight. You get plus two for this attack for each curse token added as part of this action's cost. If this attack defeats an enemy, replenish one charge or offering on an asset you control. This is so good. Yeah, it's very good. I, I wish it dealt extra damage. I don't know how you'd get around that. So this actually, I'm actually glad it doesn't deal extra damage. Okay. The reason for this is because um, I've been saying it forever. And I'm always like, the mystic problem in two player is that if you have to fight a three health enemy, you use your spell and deal two damage. And now you have to use your spell again and waste a charge, right? Fair. This now means you have that odd bumper that you don't need to worry about and you're probably going to hit. Because you're going to get like plus six if you need it. At the cost of three curse tokens, which ain't that bad. This might be my favorite melee weapon in the game. It's really cool. It's really cool. The fact that, like, and obviously if you're doing a chaos token deck, you're not going to have a huge, like, you're going to have to be very careful about yes. running out of chaos yeah, tokens, which is great. Yeah. But the fact that you can bump to plus six on your fist mm -hmm. means you don't have to play the traditional, like, how do I get my brain or book yeah. to hurt? And what's great is you also can replenish a charger offering. Replenish means you can't go above its starting uses. But, like, say, for example, you shrivel an enemy, deal two damage to it, you finish it off with the Wicked of Thame, get your charge back that you spent on your first attack for the shriveling. It's going to make Mystic Fighters 
so much more consistent. That's beautiful. Yeah. And yeah, and the fact that too, you could play it in a, like a non-chaos deck yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I would run this in pretty much. Uh, this is actually probably going to be a staple in all my fighting mystics. It also only costs two. Yeah. It's crazy. And it's got so many keywords. It does have a lot of keywords. It does have a good chunk of them. That's incredible. Yeah, it's a cool card. Can't wait to see the level five version. I know. I mean, there might be. There might, I hope there is. A level four version? Hook me up. Level five. Level five. <laughs> We're going to the moon. With I want to deny existence on this wicked of fame yeah. every time I <laughs> defeat an enemy. All right, speak to the dead. This is a one cost talent ritual that takes up your uh, spell slot and has six offerings on it. So notably, your wicked of fame can replenish it. As an action, spend any number of offerings to parlay. So that means that Alessandra can play this card. Interesting. Choose a spell or ritual event in your discard pile and reveal a number of tokens of the Chaos Bag equal to the number of offerings spent. If at least one skull or curse token is revealed, return the chosen event to your hand. I love this card. I love this card. Yes, 100%. I see why it takes up a spell slot. And, and there's a very particular type of deck that wants to be running this. Mm -hmm. But... The idea that you can just be like, my speak to the dead effectively means I get two of these spells and I can just replace them every time because I'm a, I'm a full on chaos deck mm -hmm. is incredible. Mm -hmm. There's some things that I'm curious about. Number one, how much do you spend on it? Because I think you either do like two threes, mm -hmm. a four and a two or a six. I think that's the breakdown, right? Other thing I'm curious about, um, this card obviously goes up in value with token manipulation, which mm -hmm. we actually have got in one of the... It's not in this spoiler video, but we got one of, like, the best token manipulation cards in a while in this set. Uh, number three, is there going to be a way besides Wicked of Thame to refill offerings? Because there's not many things that have offerings. I think it's a few things in this cycle, and a card called Shrine of the Morai, I think, uses offerings. And I'm curious, if there is a card that just says, like, replenish all your offerings on an asset you control and remove this from the game might boost this one as well. I'm curious. So, counterpoint. Yeah. With this, you run two Speak to the Deads in addition to all your other yeah. nonsense spell casting that you're doing. When you put it into play, it's because you don't have your second spell in hand. Mm -hmm. Or because you've had to uh, discard or spend all the charges on the card and you replace it with Speak to the Dead. Mm -hmm. You then burn all six offerings grab on a parlay action, back. grab the spell back. It is a one cost... Recursion. It is a one cost recursion if you plan to I never... Do, yeah, I think that is a good point, and like, yeah. I think you need to be in a curse deck for that to be a true. full thing, right? Yeah, true. I think, but I think that is a good point. If I, if I look at this from the, uh, 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 the perspective of a two action get one, this goes up in Dexter, because that makes that even more efficient, because now it's only, like, zero actions. Yeah. Right? Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you discard your spell with... And Cursed Rex, Rex is in... Uh, sorry, Dexter is in Curse, so we can do it really well. So you discard your Speak to the Dead. So you, you discard your empty, like, let's just say Shriveling, yeah. to play Speak to the Dead. You then grab... You use six charges, get a Curse token, bring back your Shriveling. Next turn, get rid of your Speak to the Dead, play the Shriveling... Two resources, no actions, replenish your shriveling. I dig that. Yeah. Oh, it's right. It's only events. It's only events. It's not oh, assets. It's oh. Only assets. Never mind. Um. Okay. Does that change things though? Because you had me going for a second there, but that's actually probably why it doesn't do that. Because that is really good. I mean, that's a that's those really good like deny fates. Yeah, deny um, existences. Yeah, that's a one cost recurse. Uh, recur uh, I still like it in Dexter then for that. Yeah. Unit. Uh, also as well in Mystics, there's a card called Sacrifice where the lady's killing a goat, but you can chase your goat to speak to the dead. Yeah. And draw three cards. You know, you sold me a bit more on this card. In specifically, I think Dexter, I like it in. If it was an asset, I would run this card, I think, a lot more. I don't think it'd be an auto-include, because you mm -hmm. need to have curse tokens. Yeah. But there's a lot of spell or ritual events that you do want to bring back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm into it. All right, we got a Cursed. This is a, a skill, level zero, innate cursed. Commits for a wild. While you commit a curse to a skill test, add up to three curse tokens to the chaos bag. During the skill test, treat the modifier of each curse token revealed as zero. I love this card. I love this card. I love. I. I'm very happy with it being um, a, a question mark. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it commits three chaos tokens and then treats them all as zero mm -hmm. is great. That means that you don't have to necessarily activate your yep. 
uh, ability. It also allows you to, um, I think if you're not playing a curse deck, once again, you can be like, I'll run this, I'll put some curses in there for you, but I'm not going to worry about them this turn. Yeah. Right? I'll just make it better for you. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a nice uh, It's a nice piece of a, of a curse deck puzzle, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's only a plus one to whatever you want, but yeah. I would run this in a curse yeah. deck. I mean, if you draw, if you, if you drew a curse token, it's actually a plus three when you think about it. That's true. Yeah, kind of That's is. That's true. Kind of is. If you drew two curse tokens, it's a plus five. You're going to the moon. You drew all three curse tokens you put in. Why did you play the card? Why did you? You got a <laughs> plus one for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is our last mystic card. And this one is a four experience key of Solomon. Two cost takes up the hand slot. Uh, item token bless curse is a lightning bolt. If there are more blessed than curse tokens in the chaos bag, you can remove a blessed token from the chaos bag to exhaust key of Solomon. Heal up to two damage and a horror from an investigator or ally at your location. Other lightning bolt is if there are more cursed than blessed, you can remove a curse token to gain two resources. Once again, exhausting the key of Solomon. For two resources and four experience, I kind of like this card. This card is my probably the one that I think is most exciting is just like a generic build around. Yeah. Because you know that promise of power card you play? You just add a curse token. So there's a window, so you commit it in that lightning bolt window, and then you just take the reason the curse token you put it out and gain two resources. <laughs> <laughs> no it's that's cool right i also have to say too like if i'm running two of these in my deck and i draw this one i kind of like that um it commits for a million things yes it commits for a million things yeah. this is such a good card for any time you're in a clutch moment and you're like i've already got my key of solomon out yeah yeah i'm, I'm just gonna, gonna play three, this to help my friend book, three brain or just two wilds or yeah. two fight for my yep. goon who's on the same square as me like that's a good yep. card yeah, I think this card's really exciting, um, and uh, it's uh, it's just really cool. I'm excited to like build around it. Yeah, I love it. Which is what's exciting, right? The build arounds. Yeah. All right, we got our. You know who else loves it? Who? It's the new investigator. Yeah, Kohaku. Yes. He gets to manipulate the bag to make to get yes. that balance, and then choose yeah. what he puts in. Yeah, it'll be very good in him, and it is a blessed curse card, so we can run it. Yeah. All right. He can run four of them, in fact, if I understand. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lie. Uh, that's that's so a lie. That's so funny. All right, we have. Um, the survivor investigator. And this guy's pretty neat. We got Hank Sampson. He's looking for par. That's his dad. 3153. You may be assigned damage or horror delta ally assets or in better investigator's location. Only hit soaks for five and five though. But when you would be defeated by damage and a horror, instead heal all your damage and horror and swap this card with its bonded resolute version, either side face up. Why? So then he can switch into his warden, which is 4163. You cannot be healed. You may be assigned damage or horror dealt to other investigators' location. When one or more damage is placed on you, gain two resources. Elder sign effect is plus one. Move one damage from Hank Sampson to an asset you control. And then his assistant version, which is 3344. Uh, you cannot be healed. You may be assigned damage and a horror dealt to other ally uh, assets uh, at your location and investigators at your location. As a reaction, when one or more horror is placed on you, draw a card. Plus one, move one horror from Hank Sampson onto an asset you control. They put Superman into they my do. Lovecraft. <laughs> they have a... Um, yeah, it's just like, it's, I mean, it, it makes so much sense, right? Because this is a build that's common in a lot of, like, um, MOBA games, right? Yeah. You die, you come back stronger. Yeah. Right? And it's basically that. Um, we also got Stout Hearted. It's a two-cost event. Play when you engage a non-elite enemy. Move up to two damage or no horror from Hank Sampson to that enemy as damage. It's a wild card. And then we got Where's Par? Poor Par is dead. It's Paw. No, we call it, we say Par, because that's his okay. voice. <laughs> Paw, where's Par? Where's my Par? <laughs> Hank Sampson was our last meme character that we haven't seen, because we had uh, we had uh, some characters we memed about. Dexter Drake, because Bryn always died as Dexter Drake. Charlie Kane, because he's a vampire hunter. And Hank Sampson, because he's looking for Par. Um, so that's, he's our last meme character, so th we're going to end the channel after the, after this cycle. But. <laughs> So discard cards at the top of the encounter deck until an enemy is discarded. Attach where's par to that enemy and spawn at a connected location if able. Attached enemy gains elusive. At the end of the round, Hank Sampson takes one direct horror. Oof. So really interesting weakness, I think. Mm -hmm. um, this character, I honestly am still trying to crack this motherfucker's nut. Because he is very unique. He is a very survivor investigator. His deck building, which we haven't talked about, is 35. So it's not 30, it's bigger. Interesting. Uh, survivor 0 to 5, neutral 0 to 5, up to 10 other innate and or spirit cards level 0 to 2. So what do you think of Hank Sampson? I love him. <laughs> this is another investigator that I am so excited to play because the way I view him, 
is you play him as normal, mm -hmm. playing a little bit around healing and a little bit around balancing where you take yeah. damage and everything, but you always have an end game trigger. Yep. You have your own elite version oh. enemy encounter. Because it's like a Dark Souls boss where you get your second phase. Yeah. And and I never play around the assumption that I'm going to go into the secondary phases. Yeah. But if I do, I double my health. Yeah. Uh, this allows me to play all sorts of insane ideas around the whole, like, um, starting with higher experience and just being like, I might trigger every game. Yeah. And so, like, for example, I could see a Hank Sampson build where you focus uh, really heavily on having ally assets. Yeah. Because your plan is to let yourself get nuked in your first round after taking a bit of damage and then be like, and now I'm not going to take any further damage and yep. I'm fine. Like, this character can be treated as having... 11 in one of your health pools. Yep. And nine in the other. And the nine in the other. Yeah. So uh, going back to your first point, I actually I actually kind of, I, I, I agree. My theory for Hank Sampson is he is going to be at his best when you are not trying to die. But when you do die, you basically just get to go to super mode. And you don't like, because I think like rushing to six fist is not the way. No. Because really, like, even though six fist is a lot, I think that five and six is not too big of a difference right yeah. so like i think you choose which one is better when you die right and i think you especially choose it based on the effect of what happens when damage is placed on you yeah because if yes. you've already died you're in a lower weaker position um you want to either be gaining resources with six fists to be pumping out your yeah. weapons and getting back on top or you want to be drawing cards to help reach the end game state 100 percent. i actually think that's i think that's that's i think that's very accurate his signature stout hearted is an insane card yeah and this is why i think you like don't want to die because like the other stuff is good but it's like when remember uh you looked at that kelvin character who takes damage and horror and he, he gets his stats boosted a lot of people played him like, I want my stats to get hurt so I die quicker. I think that, sorry, I get stronger quicker. And I think that was the mistake. And I think it's kind of similar with Hank Sampson. You want to be able to just survive. Yeah. Right? Um, I think he's cool, though. And I'm excited to play him. And I think they did justice to the character. I think he's a great character. Absolutely. I also think it's really fascinating that you can take damage for other investigators. Mm -hmm. That allows you to do some really fun things in the mythos phase where you can soak things that would otherwise kill another player. Yeah. Um, as long as it's not direct. And I mean, I think this goes to your point as well, why you don't want to die, right? You don't want to rush to your second phase because like, say for example, someone else is going to take a bunch of horror. You'll be like, that's okay. I'm ready to go into God mode, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's, I think that's a great, um, evaluation of what we know of this character with what we just see by looking at his cards. Should we see some survivor cards? I'd love to see them. All right. We got pitchfork. This is a three cost asset that takes up both hand slots, item tool, weapon, melee, Fight, you get plus one fist and deal plus two damage for this attack. If the, task is, the attack is successful, lose control of Pitchfork and attach to your location. Your location gains action, take control of Pitchfork. Any investigator at Pitchfork's location may trigger this ability. So you're throwing the Pitchfork? Or you're stabbing the Pitchfork so hard into an enemy and it gets stuck in them. I think that's like the flavor they're going for. For three resources... I'm not sure how I feel about it. So this is actually a, an interesting thing. So we're going to go back to the card I've been talking about this entire video, which is Sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. Sledgehammer is, I think it costs three, and it's a two-hand two uh, survivor guardian card. It has a top ability for one action, fight. You get minus one fist and deal plus one damage. Mm. And a double action, you get plus one fist and deal plus two damage. Oh. So like I think that now we can be pretty confident that the designers treat... Level zero, two hand slot, plus one fist, plus two damage as two action cost. So I think this card is actually entirely fair for how it's balanced. Mm -hmm. The question is, though, is like, is it good enough? I think the card is good, but is it consistent enough? It's very survivor, right? Because their whole thing is like, they suck. <laughs> and like they're scrappy yeah. right and this kind of fits that flavor i love the idea of passing it around right? I, like, I think i think the more players you have so if you have two goons this becomes a great card yeah two goons yeah and then it's just like pick it up and or then, a goon and a flex yeah. i think that there is uh, a lot of cool stuff that you can do with it i'm gonna play the hell out of it because yeah. the card like it's it's a weapon that's like not just easy mode i think it's a very fairly balanced melee weapon my only problem with it is that second action 
could trigger it like a, an attack on you. Yes. Yeah. Um, which I think. I mean, but like three damage kills a lot of things. That's, like that's the thing, right? Like yeah. it only gets stuck if it's successful. That's it true. doesn't get stuck stuck if you miss. Mm, right. Fair. 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 Yeah. So it's like. Assuming the enemy's dead, but it does take up both your hand slots. Mm -hmm. But there was that Tinker card we saw earlier that you can attach to an item to reduce one of its hand slots. <laughs> and it stays attached to the item, so it'll even carry from location to location. That's Dark Souls 3 Pitchfork tech right there. It is. Technically the longest spear in the game. You also can technically lose this card, too, if the location gets discarded it's attached to. Yeah. Which is kind of funny. I think the flavor of this card is awesome, though. Yeah, that is actually really fun. Yeah. All right. We got Sparrow Mask. This is a one-cost asset. Item Charm Mask. Limit one mask per investigator. Uh, uses two offerings. or punish one of these offerings after you take one or more damage or horror. As Lightning Bolt spend an offering, you get plus one, uh, plus two brain or plus two fist for the skill test. Limit once per test. I want to say that it's a Hank Sampson card. I, play, I played in Hank Sampson. Because, I mean, if he's a bird, I'm a bird. If you're a bird, where's my par? Is my par a where's bird? Where's my par a bird? <laughs> uh, it is interesting that it's only brain or foot, though. Yeah, so there was a cycle of cards in the core set for each color, that each class, that gave them a boost on two skills for one resource. And this is Survivors. Okay. Yeah. And you could generally look at those and be like, oh, these are the two cards, car, uh, skills of this class. Mm, okay. Yeah. So that's why it's those ones. Seems fine. Yeah, so this card uh, is actually these whole. This, there's a whole going to be a whole cycle of masks. People are assuming because there's already two of them. Um, the this is the one that I think the general Arkham community is going the most crazy about. It's a one cost repeatable guts or manual dexterity, right? I see it now. Yeah, um, and that's really powerful. You do have to refill them, but it's not that hard to refill them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the cards are going to be super playable. Um, I think actually these cards are going to probably just live as a one of because I don't think I ever need to draw my second one and I and also think I can survive a game without them. There is um, actually we'll get to the they haven't actually officially spoiled the Guardian one but they're they're good they seem very good and I I do think that they're going to make an impact on the game for sure. All right. We got Push to the Limit. This is a two-cost event, tactic, and improvise. Choose a weapon or tool asset in your discard pile. Resolve an action ability on that asset, ignoring all cost, including its action cost. After this effect resolves, shuffle the chosen asset into your deck. Playing this card does not provoke attacks of opportunity. That's very cool. Yeah. I actually, I really like that. It's very powerful recursion. Mm -hmm. Couple this, it's a improvised, so Wilson Richards can play it. Yeah. So you discard something with your ad hoc and then just shuffle that motherfucker back in. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. While, yeah. While, while resolving an ability again. Yes. Yeah. Uh, card is really good. I think that, yeah, I think this card's going to, like, shake up the, the card pool a bit as well. Do you think there's a, a place now with push to the limit and ad hoc and some of these other abilities for an alpha strike deck where your whole goal is to like just trigger that one ability off that one uh that one uh weapon or tool just three times in a round and just absolutely yeah. nuke something i can say it i can see that for sure okay yeah i can see that being a a fun deck to build i think this card's also just like just really good on even if you're not doing that but i think it does open that deck up completely as well yeah hell yeah i'm, I'm excited to see what happens with this card all right, Eric, I chose one more. It doesn't really fit with anyone else we talked about, but this card made me think that you would enjoy it. We got Devil. <gasps> Friend or foe. This is a one cost, two experience, ally creature cursed. So that means actually Kohaku can play it. Fun. Takes up the ally slot, soaks for three damage. At the beginning of your turn, one move one damage from your investigator to Devil. And when de forced, when Devil is defeated, deal two damage to each enemy and investigator at your location. Bomb Goat. The goat has a bomb in him. He blows up. I also like, I shall guide thy hand. Clearly a reference to the witch. Yeah. yeah. Love that. I love this card. I want to run this in every deck. This is going in my deck with the uh, red gloved mm -hmm. man. Yeah. Uh, cards. Yeah. Card. I think this is like uh, a really cool card. Um, and uh, yeah, with Will York being able to just recur it and just like keep blowing shit up. Seems really cool. Well, I also like that it, basically if you can recur it. Yeah. You want to devil your goat back so that you can take the two damage it just dealt you and feed it back onto goat. Yeah. Sorry, onto devil. Yeah. <laughs> or Black Phillip, whatever you want to call Phillip. it. Black Phillip. Yeah. Phil Philly boy. Yep. I love this card. Yeah, it's a cool one. I also love that it's like, even if you can't recur, I absolutely want to have deal two damage to each enemy and investigator at your location. 
Yeah. And also because it's the beginning of your turn, you could be like, uh, hey, you go first because little goat boy is here about to blow up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. You can, like, you can, people can play around it. Um, card's really fun, though. I think, like, it's... Uh, is it good? I don't know. But, like, it doesn't seem bad, and it seems really fun, which I think is the, the best place a card can be for something like this. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't care if it's good. I'm running this. Yeah. We love goat. All right. Well, that was the first player card roundup for uh, Eric's Feast of Hemlock Vale. We're still in spoiler season, um, and uh, once the full card pool is out, we'll be doing this, but... We will be doing another one, but if you enjoyed it, please let us know down in the comments. It does make me more excited to record more of them. So, like, you guys saying uh, that you like it is a good way for me to know, hey, we should record more of these sooner rather than later. Um, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a good one, and as always, a GG's.